Well, thank you, uh, everybody, for the uh, invite to come and present tonight. Um, my name is Justin Waters, uh, KB7YSW. Uh, I'm a telecommunications specialist with um, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, which is part of the Department of Homeland Security. Um, I'm a commu specialist, which um, means that my primary responsibility is helping uh, states in my regions with developing their uh, communications unit planning. Um, I also uh, deliver, help deliver courses uh, occasionally. Some of you may have seen me. I've taught a few OXCOM classes and many other classes uh, over the years. Um, I also help with curriculum development, uh, planning, and uh, those types of things. Um, I was asked to uh, present uh, about three different things. Uh, the first thing being about CISA and what it is that um, CISA does. Uh, the second thing uh, being about what it's like to be on deployment uh, and what uh, deploying for unplanned and planned events really entails. Um, and then the third thing was to talk about um, the the uh, NIFOG and OXFOG apps and some of the various other field operations guides that are available from uh, the CISA ICTAP program. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is um, CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, uh, was created with the um, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Act of 2018. Um, it took uh, primarily the National Preparedness and Programs Directorate from the Department of Homeland Security and rolled it into its own uh, quasi-independent agency. Uh, so what we are responsible for is exactly what the title says, uh, primar pri primarily uh, infrastructure security and cybersecurity. And Included as part of infrastructure is public safety uh, emergency communications, along with uh, many other critical infrastructure sectors like um, electricity and water and, and um, all those other things that we rely on for our daily conveniences. Um, we, all of these things that are listed um, along the right-hand side of the slide are all things that we do. Um, promote information and data sharing. We develop partnerships with the critical infrastructure sectors and between the critical infrastructure sectors. Uh, we do risk assessments and risk analysis. Uh, we help uh, cybersecurity being the big buzzword. Uh, we do a lot in cybersecurity, both um, in the conventional uh, means that you would think of uh, protecting corporate data networks, but also with uh, some unconventional things that people don't normally associate with being a cybersecurity risk, but but are. Um, within um, CISA is the um, Nationwide Interoperability Services or National Interoperability Services. And part of National Interoperability Services is the Emergency Communications Division that, uh, that I work in. Back that up. Emergency Communications Division and Nation, National Interoperability Services is under the Emergency Communications Division. Um, Emergency Communications Division is what you probably are familiar with if you've ever taken part in, if you've ever uh, been to an OXCOM class or a COMEL class or a COMT class. Uh, we'll talk about that. Um, but just what I talked about at the first of the slide, the things that I do, um, that's what the Emergency Communications Division does for um, all 56 states and territories. Uh, we work uh, at an international level, also assisting other countries who request uh, help with the same uh, types of services that we provide here in the United States. Um, in addition to the division or the the uh, subdivision that I work in, Nationwide Interoperability Services, is also PTS or Priority Telecommunication Services. Um, they are. Uh, the group that provides you or gets and WPS service, if you're familiar with what that is, I'll talk about. Um, 
And then we have advanced technology services that um, works with things like P25 standards and um, developing those standards and federal interoperability, uh, federal and, and state and local interoperability and those types of things. Who we support? Um, we support primarily um, public safety, uh, government, municipalities, uh, critical infrastructure. Um, those are some of the numbers um, up there on the screen that you can see of the base of stakeholders that we support uh, for uh, emergency communications, interoperability and operability um, so that they can communicate with each other during their normal day-to-day uh, -day routine um, and also so that they can communicate across um, boundaries, whether that be uh, whether that be physical boundaries, uh, city city boundaries, state boundaries, um, or whether that be across um, disciplines, uh, fire, EMS, police, um, power, the, the power sector, uh, wireline telephone carriers, um, all of those critical infrastructure entities. Uh, we have um, programs to develop, to, to to develop plans and um, interoperable technology or help them to utilize interoperability technology so that they can talk to each other uh, in times of emergency when when it hits the when it, when it gets bad and and uh, everybody's scrambling to get where they're going. Um, these are our core competencies that we follow. So National and statewide planning and execution I talked about. If you're familiar with the National Emergency Communications Plan, uh, with the statewide communications interoperability plans or SCIP plans, you may have heard them called, uh, those are things that we help develop. We help to coordinate federal grants for emergency communications. Uh, we have uh, people dedicated to, na to national governance activities. So the SAFECOM program, if you're familiar with what that is, um, the Emergency Communications Preparedness Center, uh, statewide governance bodies um, like the SIEC or uh, SIGB I'll talk about um, in your state that, that um, deals with uh, interoperability at your state level. Uh, priority Communication Services uh, used to be called PTS, now it's called PCS, um, is Government Emergency Tele communication system or GETS and WPS, wireless priority services. Um, those are services that allow you to make priority telephone calls um, in times of emergency or if you need to have uh, restoration of critical services, you can utilize uh, PCS in order to have those, um, those telecommunication services flagged as priority so that you get uh, faster restoration. Uh, in time of outage if there's an emergency. Uh, we do technical assistance and outreach, which is the primary function that I kind of live in, and that is um, developing, uh, building, and delivering training and other types of uh, technical assistance and resources to uh, federal, state, local, tribal, territorial, and even international stakeholders. Um, and then we have uh, uh, a component that collects data from all the other components and builds different types of assessments um, about where uh, the nation and the states, individual states are in their progress towards becoming fully interoperable, uh, help to identify gaps in areas where they, they can improve uh, on what they're doing. Um, the ICTAP program, like I said, technical assistance. So um, at no cost provides uh, communications training uh, that I'll talk about again in a minute. Um, we partner with um, another uh, division of CISA uh, that has uh, emergency communications coordinators, individuals who serve as emergency communications coordinators for every region. Uh, some of the regions have more than one, but the ECCs, as we call them, emergency communications coordinators, coordinate with state level personnel, usually the SWIC or statewide interoperability coordinator to coordinate the needs of each state um, as, 
as as far as what technical assistance they require and then how is best to deliver that. Um, that partnership is key to the program. Uh, so the SWIC and the ECC work together to identify needs. Um, and then at the request of the SWIC, the ECC will make um, those requests to the ICTAP program where we will then uh, deliver that technical assistance to the state or to the region or, or whoever it is within the state that has requested it. We also provide a lot of that same support to the tribal community and tribes are, uh, because of the way uh, they work, they're a little bit of a different process, um, but we deliver the same services for the most part to uh, most of the tribes in the country. Um, so emergency communications planning and, and training and other, uh, other types of technical assistance. I talked about national interoperability services, um, state, local, tribal, territorial, international emergency communications. Um, governance is one of the things that we do. Um, we um, coordinate the SAFECOM program. We coordinate the NICSWIC program, which is the National Council of Statewide Interoperability Coordinators. And then we have uh, FPIC, or the Federal Coordination Component, that I will also talk about. Um, so SAFECOM um, has, is a, a group of public safety professionals, uh, 73 members in total, that represent 33 different public safety and intergovernmental associations. Their job is to uh, promote interoperability through various things that they do, programs that they develop, committees that, that work um, on different uh, issues or problems um, that make, that, that promote interoperability. Um, probably where everybody has heard the most about SAFECOM is if you're familiar with the SAFECOM interoperability continuum. Um, that if you've ever taken the OXCOM class or any of the other classes uh, you know about, which um, provides guidance on how to become, um, how, to, how to improve your interoperability, both voice uh, communications and data communications interoperability. Um, NICSWIC, the Na National Council of Statewide Interoperability Coordinators, is the SWICs from all the states that get together. Um, and they, uh, they are the stakeholders, or they're some of the stakeholders that represent who we uh, hope to help, um, that we, everything we do is, is um, ultimately for the, the 56 states and territories, the tribes that we work with um, to facilitate improved communications interoperability among all the people in those states. Um, FPIC I talked about, F uh, Federal Partnership for Interoperable Communications is uh, a committee that works to uh, promote interoperability between federal government entities and state and local uh, entities. Um, there's more than 190 individuals who participate on that committee. That's, this is also one of the things that we coordinate at CISA. Uh, priority Communication Services. Um, so, your Government Emergency Telecommunication Service, or GETS, um, is a, a service that you can get that gives you a telephone number and a PIN card that you can use to make priority telephone calls. Um, it, it basically puts you at the top of the queue on wireline services. Um, WPS, or Wireless Priority Service, is, a, is essentially the same thing that you add as a, an additional service to your cell phone. And then by dialing a code, uh, before you make a call, you get priority through the wireless portion of the network. Um, TSP, or Telecommunication Service Priority, I talked about, um, is the uh, service that you can put on existing or new telecommunications services. So if you have trunk lines or, uh, or telephone circuits from the phone company that come into a facility that are priority for emergency communications, uh, you can add TSP service to them. And uh, TSP uh, will get you uh, higher priority in the repair queue or in the installation queue uh, if you're ordering repair of, of existing services or if you're ordering new services. And then NGNPS or next generation networks um, is how they are currently working to provide these same types of services for, uh, for 
video and data communications across next generation networks like IP networks and uh, those types of services. Um, GETS, WPS has only worked on traditional um, wire-based tele telecommunication circuits or on um, cellular-based uh, circuits. So NGNPS is, is about moving that forward into um, new communications methods. So um, our, IT, our, our ICTAP program offerings, to summarize, um, we have technical assistance offerings across all of the lanes of the interoperability continuum related to um, governance, standard operating procedures, technology, training and exercises, and usage. Um, we also have technical assistance offerings related to NG911, um, our next generation 911, uh, LMR systems, security um, and engineering, and cybersecurity awareness and cybersecurity assessments of those systems. Of those offerings, training and exercises are uh, by far the most requested offerings that we have. Uh, we, we, we teach a lot of classes throughout the country, um, and we do a lot of uh, exercises. Um, technical assistance offerings you request through your statewide interoperability coordinator um, or that their designee. And I don't want to uh, I don't want to take anything away from a future presentation, but as I understand. Um, in a couple of weeks, you will have, um, I believe it's the Arkansas SWIC, Penny Rubo, who will talk more about some of this stuff that I'm talking about as far as technical assistance offerings and what a, what a SWIC does. Um, so I would encourage you, if you're interested, to tune in for that presentation. Um, the service offerings guide is available at that uh, website address that's on the screen. Um, and it will be on the slide uh, that will be posted at the end of my presentation, so you can uh, refer to that. That gives you a complete listing of what, what services are available. Um, as far as the current classes that we teach, the, uh, this is the, the list of communications interoperability and, and ICS-related courses that we uh, currently offer. Um, the COML and the COMT courses and the OXCOM course are uh, currently in uh, the process of being updated. Um, the other courses were either recently updated or are new enough that they're not yet ready for an update. Uh, we have train the trainer courses for COML, COMT, and OXCOM. So you can, uh, if you meet the requirements that are listed in the, in the services offering guide, you can become an instructor for those classes. Um, and then we have a state-sponsored program for all of the classes right now, except for, um, that says INTD, but it's really supposed to say ITSL. Um, we do not do state-sponsored ITSL classes and we don't do state-sponsored train the trainer courses yet, um, but those may be coming uh, in the future. Uh, things that we are working on right now, um, ITSS or Information Technology Support Specialist, uh, a help desk specialist position, a uh, communications coordinator position, and a cybersecurity planner. These are part of what we call the new um, ICT branch, which is currently a proposal that will move um, the communications and IT functions all into a new branch under logistics, which may be called the ICT branch or maybe not called the ICT branch. We don't know yet. Um, but FEMA is currently uh, reviewing uh, those proposals uh, to become part of a revision to NIMS that will change the ICS organization chart a little bit and um, where, the, where everybody kind of fits in within that organization. Um, just a little note about OXCOM. Um, OXCOM, or Auxiliary Communications, um, is an all-inclusive, kind of all-encompassing term for a lot of volunteer people that uh, help in times of emergency with communications using a lot of different um, communication systems or methods um, that are listed there. Uh, we have groups in that are active in all 50 states. This is just a, a small uh, sampling of some of the groups, uh, non-governmental organizations that are uh, involved in the OXCOM program or have um, 
are, are participating in the OXCOM program, I should say. Um, if you have any questions about OXCOM, if you haven't taken the OXCOM course or you have more, you want more information about the OXCOM program, uh, I will have an email address at the end of the presentation that you can send uh, email to, uh, to get more information. Um, the OXCOM course was developed in 2010. Um, as of yesterday, we've de delivered the course 197 times with 15 more uh, pending courses to be delivered so far this year. I, I imagine we'll get more requests. Uh, it's a 20 hour course that can be done over two days or three days, uh, either in person or virtually. We, we uh, usually do them over weekends uh, on a Friday or a Saturday or a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or a Saturday, Sunday, um, so that it doesn't interfere with uh, work schedules, but they have been done on um, other days. And the, the primary mission of the OXCOM course is to um, emphasize how volunteer emergency communicators um, fit into the NIMS ICS system and what their relationship is with the COMEL um, and how to effectively work uh, within that role. It's a very good class. I mean, if you haven't taken it, I, I would highly encourage you to take it. Um, it is non, what's the right way to put it? It's non-denominational. Um, so it, uh, it has emphasis on communications, not on any particular um, group or organization or belonging to any particular group or organization. And that is about CISA ECD. Um, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about deployment, um, what it's like to be on a deployment. So um, just a little bit more about me. My first unplanned event deployment was in 1998 to, uh, for some flash flooding that happened in St. George. My role in that deployment was I sat at the National Weather Service office in Salt Lake City and uh, had an HF operator that was there with me. Um, and he, he communicated over uh, HF radio to stations down in St. George taking damage reports. And I relayed that information over a uh, two meter uh, repeater to other uh, interested parties that were uh, in uh, Utah at the, at the Capitol building and the Emergency Operations Center. Our shift was, a, was an overnight shift. Um, I worked entirely on the amateur radio and uh, that was my job for that event. Um, my second unplanned event, some of you may have heard about, um, the large tornado that we had um, in August of 1999 that happened during the outdoor retailers show um, in Salt Lake City where um, it took out some tents and uh, where uh, the trade show was taking place and uh, did some damage to other parts of the city. Um, I worked in the state EOC for that event and I never touched a ham radio. Uh, I, was, I was assigned to a public safety radio channel and I spent uh, a day and a half roughly taking damage reports from crews that were out um, doing assessments immediately in the aftermath of the tornado. When I arrived at the, at the East State EOC, the tornado actually was still going on. So it was right in the initial response phase. Um, but as a ham radio operator to be put um, into a different uh, mode of operation was a unique experience. Um, something that took a little bit of uh, quickly getting used to. Um, in 2001, I got um, voluntold to go deal with communications out of fire, uh, the Molly Fire near Santa Quin, Utah, uh, because all of the federal comms people in the area were tied up on other fires. We had a very busy wildland fire that season, and I was literally baptized by fire. Um, so, with no previous experience in how wildland fire worked, uh, just being a, a radio technician for the county um, and fixing and managing radio systems, I went out and became uh, a, a field deputized COMEL for the first operational period of that fire. Uh, from that, um, I became 
much more involved in wildland fire. Uh, for many years, I did um, initial attack fires and single resource deployments uh, up to the point where I eventually was rostered on a type two team uh, for three years, uh, Great Basin Team 6, which is a type two federal wildland fire incident management team as the COMEL. Um, I also am involved with uh, heavily with the FEMA Urban Search and Rescue System. I'm a member of Utah Task Force One um, as a communications specialist. Um, I'm the COMEL for the red uh, FEMA search and or USAR uh, incident support team. And I also currently am the chair of the of the USAR uh, communications advisory group, which is sets policy for equipment and standards used during um, USAR uh, deployment. Uh, so I have a varying level of experience um, that I only illustrate as I talk about this. So deployment life um, can be uh, very odd if you're not used to it. Um, as you can see, the tent farm there um, out in the weeds uh, is on a wildland fire where you might expect to live. Uh, you get up very early in the morning and you go to a briefing uh, with a bunch of people that are standing around in the cold with their coffee. Uh, what are we gonna do today? And then we go out and do it and we come back tired and weary at the end of the day. Um, and we get a chance to eat and maybe take a shower and go sleep in our tent in the field uh, before we go back out to uh, duty. This is a wildland fire, typical wildland fire deployment. Um, as you can see from the picture down there in the bottom right with the picnic benches, um, that was a fire that I was on in Oregon. Uh, we were based in an area uh, that was essentially a fairgrounds. Um, and so we were in some buildings that had at some point also been used to show and shelter animals. Um, it's a lot of fun, but uh, it's, it's a lot different than uh, being at home or being in an EOC. Every once in a while, you get a surprise. At the bottom of that uh, was a large thunderstorm that rolled through. Um, you can see all of our antennas there taped along the fence or set up along the fence with the flagging on them and uh, blowing steadily. Um, we got rained on a little bit, but not too bad. Um, but that's, that's one example of deployment life. Sometimes you might sleep in a hotel. Sometimes you might sleep in a big tent with a bunch of other people in cots, sometimes you might sleep in your own little tent. Uh, it varies greatly depending on the type of deployment that you're on. Uh, another wildland fire, a couple more wildland fire examples here. Um, this is my tent set up uh, in the weeds um, because it was the only flat spot that I could find on this hill. And there's other tents sparse, sparsely populated all over through wherever with the fire burning in the background. Um, this was a repeater that we set up at that site, setting up another repeater on a different fire here. Um, and this picture over here is back at that same uh, fire that I talked about in Oregon um, after the rain had come through the next day. Now we're back to sun and smoke. Uh, a lot of varying, crazy varying conditions that you can expect. Um, everybody has that deployment. Everybody I know that deploys has that deployment that they don't ever forget. Uh, this one was the one that I will never forget. Um, this is a flash flood that occurred in Utah in, um, I think it was 2015. Uh, I, I won't forget the deployment. I can't ever remember when it, when it happened, but uh, a flash flood killed uh, 21 people. Um, 13 of those people were all from one town. They were in uh, two vehicles. There was three adults and ten little kids in two vehicles that happened to be crossing a bridge when the when the flood came and took the vehicles. The flood took the vehicles with it. Um, all of the victims were recovered except for one uh, four year old boy who was never found. Um, people from my team went back for weeks afterwards, just on their own, um, to still keep looking uh, because. Uh, you know, everybody wanted to find him, um, but he he was never found. Um, but this is the one that I always remember that I don't that that uh, stays with me sometimes because I had uh, kids that were that same age at the time that that this occurred. So uh, this was one of the harder ones. But um, 
different things that you get used to or don't get used to. Um, hurricanes, uh, I've been to a lot of hurricanes. Um, there's a couple pictures here from, I think, North Carolina and Florida, um, if I remember right. These two here in the middle are from North Carolina. This was from our hotel room in Florida. Uh, so like I said, again, um, varying different places that you might expect to uh, be, be housed um, or work uh, when you're on a deployment. So we stayed in the upper floors of this hotel, um, oddly enough, during a hurricane. And then uh, the IC, the uh, incident command post was set up down in a conference room of the hotel. Uh, if I remember right, we were on the fourth or fifth floor of that hotel and the hurricane came through uh, the area that night while we were asleep. And when we woke up, um, all of our bags that we had put um, in our hotel room next to the sliding glass window um, were wet because the rain blowing against the sliding glass window had pushed water in on the carpet um, about four feet from the window and got all of our stuff wet. We slept through it. We didn't, we didn't hear it happening, but uh, it did happen nonetheless. So uh, sometimes even when you think you're, uh, you're going to be dry and, and content in a hotel room, you're, you're not always. Um, so part of that being deployed is uh, being prepared for anything really. Uh, a cross-discipline deployment picture here. Uh, my USAR task force uh, was deployed to uh, wildland fires in Oregon, oddly enough. Uh, well, I shouldn't say oddly enough, but it was an unusual deployment. It was the first time, uh, at least that I know of, that USAR resources had been deployed on a wildland fire, and it's because this fire had burned uh, through a couple of towns, and they requested the USAR resources to uh, help search for victims through those towns. Um, this picture was taken by the um, the forward communication vehicle operator. Uh, this is one of the USAR uh, FCVs, we call them, or comm buggies. Um, he was out scouting for a, a radio site and stopped to take a picture of this tree that had been uh, pushed over and, and that root system that you can see the, the size of it. But that I call that a cross-discipline deployment because it was an unusual, even though I've been on a lot of wildland fires, um, it was unusual to go to a wildland fire with the USAR task force. During training, uh, so this is one from uh, LA County. Uh, we were doing some training there when a wildland fire broke out. Uh, this is over near Santa Clarita. Um, and Attend, or we, we actually lost resources from the training to go help with the fire for a short period of time. Um, so there again, be prepared for anything, even when you're not expecting deployment or you're, or you're thinking that you're, uh, that you're not going to be getting deployed because you're on training, you never know. Um, incidentally, this uh, rubble pile here in the front is not, this is part of the training ground. Um, at LA County, this is not uh, anything to do with with any real disaster. It, it's set up um, to teach structural collapse specialists and rescue specialists um, how to get into rubble piles and get victims out. Um, but this was the smoke the next day after that fire had laid down uh, in the valley on uh, I-5 going south uh, towards Los Angeles. And then you have the ones where you get ready for nothing. Um, this was during Hurricane Dorian um, that I affectionately call one of the biggest MOBEXs in the history of the USAR program uh, because we deployed uh, a lot of resources in anticipation of a hurricane that everybody kept saying was going to make landfall and it never actually did. Um, so one of the things that they did here was they moved all the medical helicopters and even a military helicopter you can see there uh, inside the Orange County Convention Center in Orlando so that they would be safe from the hurricane. And then after the hurricane passed, they'd be able to roll them out and put them in the air to go uh, do what they needed to do. Um, they also have a bunch of uh, USAR rescue assets that are there inside the convention center uh, on the Expo Hall floor as well. These pictures are a little bit blurry because I snapped them out of a video that I took. Um, but this was uh, this exercise that it ended up being taught um, a, 
all of the responders that 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 took part in it a lot of things about um, nationwide deployments and how to move people and materials and equipment across the country for what was anticipated to be a very large emergency. And we were really lucky that it it was very minor. Um, but I mostly just like the cool picture of all the helicopters parked inside. So that was why I put it in here. Um, so the last thing that we're gonna talk about now um, is our field operations guides. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the um, National Interoperability Field Operations Guide. Um, I think I clicked too many slides, or did I? Yes, I did. Um, the first version, version 1.0, came out in September of 2007 and was created by Ross Merlin, uh, who has since retired from DHS and is working in the private sector. Uh, but Ross did a lot of work to bring uh, this material to the start, and a lot of other individuals put in a lot of time and effort to uh, add to this to the point that we got to uh, from 78 pages to, oh, I lost my version that was sitting here. I don't even remember how many pages. 1.61a uh, um, was the last revision of the original version. Oh, it went to 126 pages. Sorry, uh, it was right there on the screen in front of me. Um, this had a lot of reference material in it that hadn't before been uh, easily compiled into a single place for quick reference. Um, interoperability frequencies, um, common references for how to wire different types of connectors and uh, frequency bands that you could use and um, just a lot of different telephone numbers. I can't even think of all the stuff that was in there. Um, these uh, revisions to version one were mostly just about rule changes and updates. There were small additions of content, um, but not a lot. Um, then we went to version 2.0 in August of 2021, um, which was a major change. The book's a little bit larger now. The, the printed version is a little bit larger. Um, height and width larger, uh, lots of pages thicker, um, with more, with new uh, material that was not part of the original uh, version one um, and the revisions has been added, uh, but also uh, revisions to the content that was in those previous versions. So um, move to the next slide here. Uh, 2.01 is the current version and has some minor changes and updates in it. And with 2.01 came the electronic version, the eNIFOG, um, in June of 2022, which is currently available. And I'll get to a slide on that. Um, the printed version uh, is a wirebound book. And that email address right there, uh, you can send an email to, and they will direct you to a form that you can fill out to request printed copies. Um, a lot of things that were updated in there. So uh, rule changes that have taken place since version one, uh, fonts were changed. Um, the size of the pages, like I said, is a little bit different. Um, all of the tables were reformatted into this uh, type of, of format like you see on here. Uh, they updated notes on the tables, um, the footnotes on everything and uh, readability issues, so they were a little easier to read. Um, some new content that was added, interoperability watch out situations, um, conventions or reasons for use for interoperability. Um, we added, there, there have been some additions to the 700 megahertz um, interoperability channels, nationwide interoperability channels. So we have some low power itinerant channels now and uh, deployable trunk system channels that we can, that, that are, that can be used with the approval of the SWIC. Um, emission designators that have been added and how those break down, uh, some formulas for calculating uh, line of sight distances, station classes, some, some uh, content about encryption, 
Uh, somebody mentioned something about shares. There is information in here about shares um, and shares usage. Um, and then some uh, just ideas for interference, mitigation, and management. Um, a lot of content has been refreshed, new pictures, um, better readability, uh, all of that kind of stuff. You can see on here a FEMA regions map has been added. Um, CISA follows the same regional boundaries as um, FEMA does. Here is an example of a GETS card uh, and what that looks like that's also uh, in there. There's uh, information about GETS service and how to get GETS service. Um, information about wireless carriers, uh, how you can get um, enhanced coverage from your wireless carriers, AT&T, Verizon, uh, Sprint, or T-Mobile now, um, and questions that you may be asked when making those requests for services. Uh, a lot of new information on satellite services that wasn't in there before. So this page shows um, the MSAT beam coverage map is just one example and the phone numbers for uh, technical assistance, uh, instructions on how to make calls appropriately with your satellite phone, depending on who your satellite phone carrier is. Uh, a lot of information in here. Also a lot of new IT information that has been added in here. Um, if you don't have one of these, I would encourage you to uh, get one or um, download the app. And we'll talk about the app here in just a second. Um, some more IT information that has been added that was not in version one. Uh, information about cybersecurity and common uh, defenses against cyber attack. Um, that you can just some basic stuff that you can do uh, and what uh, incident response for a cyber attack might look like. Uh, the time zone maps are in here. Uh, so distribution, uh, the final printing was in August. We are still in that phase of doing initial hard copy uh, distribution. So if you've taken a class um, since August of 2022, any one of those commu classes that I listed, you probably received a new printed copy of the NIFOG. They have been sent out to all of, all of the classes. Um, the emergency communications coordinators and the SWICs are currently in uh, process of receiving theirs. Uh, some SWICs and ECCs have them uh, already and some don't. So they're still, that, that process is still ongoing. You can, uh, I'm sorry, backing up just a little bit. Um, once that process is done, uh, getting them out to SWICs and uh, ECCs, the, they'll start fulfilling individual requests. So if you've put in a request after August of 2022, um, be patient. They are working through those requests. Uh, if you put in a request before August of 2022, you may want to put in a new request because they kind of cleared the queue, if you will. Um, and so some of those earlier requests may not, uh, may not still be in the system. Uh, you can download an electronic version, like I said, um, that link there on the page. You can also download an app for uh, both Apple and Android devices, and those QR codes you can snap really quick, or like I said, um, these slides will be uh, available uh, on the Rat Pack site uh, after the presentation, um, so you can get these. But if you search for eNIFOG, um, in either one of the app stores, it'll come up. Uh, make sure it's the version that is produced by ICTAP. Um, there are some others available that you have to pay for. These are free. Um, the nice thing about having the electronic versions, uh, number one, it is stored on your device. So once you've downloaded the app, you don't have to, um, you don't have to have connectivity in order to use it. Uh, but the other thing that's nice is it's really easy to get updated content and the electronic versions are are updated uh, at least in the past have been updated more frequently than the printed versions um, 
So you may have a, an electronic version that has a revision number that a printed copy didn't exist for. Um, just because it's uh, less expensive to obviously to update the electronic versions. Um, uh, from that website address that was on the previous slide, you, uh, you can request copies where you can send an email um, per these instructions. Um, and then uh, once they were, as they work through the queue, you can, uh, you'll, they'll ship you a hard copy of it. Um, the Oxfog uh, is an anomaly. Um, an official printed version, the government has not ever printed a version of this, the federal government rather, has not ever printed a version of this document. But there are printed versions out there. Um, these, there are a number of states that have printed their own version of it. Um, so you may see printed versions running around out there. There also is um, a major online bookseller that may or may not sell a copy of this, but it's not very user friendly. Um, but I didn't say that. Um, there are printed versions of this out there, but they were not, these have not ever officially been printed by the federal government. They may be in the future printed by the federal government. That, um, that decision is still forthcoming, but that is because the document right now is in revision. Um, and the Oxfog will soon be available. Uh, version two of the Oxfog will soon be available. In the meantime, you can download this version 1.1 uh, from the same website that you can download the PDF version of the NIFOG. Um, there also is a eOxfog version um, that you can download from the uh, Apple App Store or the Google Play Store, either one. Again, just search for eOxfog um, and make sure it's the ICTAP version. Um, and you, it works and looks pretty much exactly the same as the uh, NIFOG does, as do many other field operation guides that have been produced by the ICTAP program. So some of these, uh, there, there are ones that have been done for states. There have been ones that have been done for regions. Um, there's even one that was done um, in reference to a particular radio system within a state. Um, a lot of different ones available. Some of them are only available in PDF or, or hard copy printed format. Um, and you may have to request them because uh, the state or entity that had it created doesn't make it publicly available. Uh, there are many that are apps that you can download um, if you search, uh, if, you, if you get to uh, on either the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store, if you get to the eNIFOG and then click the publisher of ICTAP, it'll show you all of the other things that have been published and all, uh, all of the electronic ones that are not restricted will come up in that list. Some of them, uh, like I said, are restricted and you have to have a special link in order to be able to get to them to download them. Um, there's a lot of content in these that's the same. Um, there's a lot of content in them that's different. If there's one for your state, I would uh, highly encourage you to get it. Um, in the future, uh, because of costs associated with updating each of these individual apps, there will be a new app called uh, Public Safety Library, I think is going to be the name of it. This will be um, this will be the repository for all of the eFOG or electronic field operation guides. They will all be within one app um, because the cost of updating each fog guide individually is, much greater than just having one app that is updated um, periodically. So uh, within that app, you would find uh, both the eNIFOG, eOxFOG, and any of these regional or state guides that are available. Um, if you can't find it, check with your SWIC or the SIEC, uh, Statewide, Inter uh, Statewide Interoperability Executive Committee, sorry, that one's a mouthful, um, or Statewide Interoperability Governance Board, um, depending on which uh, one of those your state has, um, some uh, representative from one of those bodies or your SWIC should be able to tell you uh, where to obtain one of these if your state has one. Um, every state 
for every region usually has tactical interoperable communications plans, but they're not always made um, into these easily carried field operations guides. Um, so talk to your SWIC um, or to your board and they can enlighten you as to what is available. Um, with that said, as I promised, that was a lot of talking, a lot of talking, I apologize. Um, some uh, information sources, um, so the CISA Emergency Communications website link. Um, if you have questions specifically about OXCOM, uh, you can send them to um, that email address, oxcom at cisa.dhs.gov, or you're welcome to email me. My email address is on there as well. Uh, just remember the Waters has two T's, not one. Um, and I will be happy to answer uh, any questions that you have by email. Um, there is also a Facebook group called the Oxcom Brotherhood and Sisterhood um, that has a lot of uh, people who have taken the class and, and been involved in the Oxcom community uh, that have good information and can answer questions and uh, you can request to uh, join that group as well. And with that said, I'll leave that slide up and I'll uh, ask if there are any questions that I can answer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Uh, if you lower your desktop there, you'll be able to see some of the chat messages a lot better. And the, uh, there's a bunch of stuff in chat. Has anybody got their hands up? They do. How about Dan in California? Go ahead. Let's wait till the uh, chat questions are answered because one of them might have something to do with what I'm interested in, which is were you serving on, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, type one USAR team and the um, Great Basin type one team at the same time? Uh, yes and no. Um, I was, it did, there was some, well, I have been on the USAR search and rescue task force while I was also on the Great Basin type two team, yes. Um, since I have been on the, um, on the federal USAR incident support team. I have not been on the wildland fire incident management team, but not because I'm not qualified. It's just because time hasn't allowed me to do both things. Um, so well, let's see, does that uh, answer the question? Yeah, yeah. Your business has changed significantly since the 1980s. Yes. Well, actually, what, okay. it's changed significantly since DHS became a department. Yes, uh, that too. So thanks for the presentation. It was, it was pretty thorough. Thanks. Yes, you're welcome. Yeah, you got your hand up. Justin, I'm just curious. Do you uh, have any sort of timetable on when those uh, other classes that are under development will be available? Uh, I do not yet. They are, so there's quite a process that has to be gone through with NIMS for any new courses and uh, for course revisions, but for new courses, especially because the positions are new as well. Um, so right now they're still going through the process of getting the actual job descriptions created. And then from the job descriptions, task books will be created. And that's the that's the place that we're in right now is getting the task books developed. Once the task books are approved, then we build course curriculum based around uh, what's in the task book. And um, then from there, the courses start, you know, coming together and getting delivered. So I would imagine um, it will probably not be until next year before you'll see those new classes starting, starting to roll out, but it could be, could be earlier than that. It's, it's hard to say speed of government. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. How are we doing in the chat there? Justin, do you see anything there? Hey, I see the chat. So um, Steve asked if I was with Lafayette Group. No, I am no longer with Lafayette Group. I used I used to um, work part-time for Lafayette Group just as an instructor. Um, and I since have um, joined the government side now full-time. Um, so I am not with Lafayette anymore. Um, another Steve asked, where does SHARES fit into the big picture? So SHARES is um, an HF 
uh, communication system that has a lot of um, operators um, throughout the country that are mostly government and military organizations, um, state, local, uh, federal government and military. Um, and shares is becoming part of what we would consider to be uh, the Oxcom uh, or part of the Oxcom program in a way, if that makes sense, um, or shares would be one of the methods that Oxcom might utilize for communications. Um, but that is still an ongoing thing, uh, is in flux right now. Um, let's see. So he was just answering the questions about shares and shared, it's called the shared resources radio program um, is where shares come from, comes from. Um, when deploying operators to a disaster response, the operators may be properly credentialed, but will not have been processed by the local authority with regard to background checks. Since they aren't normally resident in that jurisdiction, how can the deployed operators work in that locality without having the local background checks? There is a lot of ways that that works, um, and it is that that's a that's a long answer to a question. Um, the short answer is is that generally when a jurisdiction requests resources from another jurisdiction, they accept that those re, that those individuals that they're sending are credentialed and qualified. Um, whether that be under an EMAC request or some uh, inter, inter, intra-state agreement uh, that, that allows local, uh, uh, local groups to share resources with each other. Uh, city A requests resources from City B, and as part of that request, City A um, takes City B's word that everybody's credentialed and qualified and been through that process. And so that's typically how that works. But there's really a lot of different ways that it could work. Great answer. Um, John Peterson and Carla Juren spoke to the group last year and Greg Hauser, yes, they are all very big um, in the Oxcom community. Um, John Peterson really um, was the CISA person that started the Oxcom uh, program and Carla and Greg have been big uh, proponents uh, and supporters of the program. Greg Hauser is from North Carolina and Carla Jerns is from Texas. She's actually the Texas SWIC. Um, I'm not sure how I got the draw to draw the straw this time, but uh, I've enjoyed coming and talking about it either way. I don't do as good of a job at it as John does, uh, but he's been he's been talking about it a lot more than I have. So, um, but uh, John is still very much part of the program, and uh, if you email that Oxcom email address, he's probably the person that you will get answered by. Um, if your bag can get wet, it will. That is 100% true. Um, better nothing than something. I think that was probably referring to my helicopters in the convention center picture, and yes, you are correct. Definitely better to have nothing than something. Um, are the interoperability channels supported in each state and how is this verified? So yes, the interoperability channels are part of, well, most of the interoperability channels are defined as nationwide interoperability channels in the FCC rules. Uh, they have to be coordinated by somebody though, uh, unfortunately, because everybody can't just get on them and start using them. Um, and so the, F, the FCC left that up to uh, at least for the state and local, the, the FCC governed interoperability channels, the, the uh, FCC left that up to the SWIC or uh, whoever is um, designated by the governance board or the interoperability committee of the state. In some cases that got deferred to the ESF2 desk at the state EOC level. Um, in some places um, it's the SWIC himself or herself. Um, but, but there is a process that is different in every state that you should go through before you use those interoperability channels. Um, and um, it, because it's different in every state, I can't speak exactly to it. But if, if you have questions about where you are, um, send me an email and I can get you the information of who coordinates their usage in your area. Um, 
ACS operators are really the SWIC and other organizations for the province of directors or EM. What is the value of operators knowing tonight's presentation? Um, the SWIC doesn't always work for the emergency management organizations. SWICs fit in a lot of different places. Um, so for example, here in Utah, our SWIC is actually an employee of the department that runs the statewide radio system. Um, in some places, the SWICs are, are employees of uh, the military affairs department. Um, in some states, they work for the emergency management organization. In some states, they work for public safety. It, it widely varies um, who they work for. Um, mostly what this was about um, was having a knowledge of what's available and how to uh, get access to it or what it is that we really do. Um, and I probably covered a few things that not everybody was interested in. Um, I apologize for that. I tried to give a broad overview of what the agency does um, because there is quite a lot of things that we do. And, and um, you probably, if you've been out um, in the emergency response community, you've probably seen little pieces of every part of things that we do. Um, but putting the finger on exactly which part it was is hard sometimes because the pieces move around a lot. Um, but yeah, um, see if there's any other questions. I could share the order of operations on getting to a training plan with Newington. Uh, I assume you're referring to the ARRL um, and that is something that is always in continual conversation uh, with John. Um, he would be a better person to talk about that than I would be if that is what you're referring to. Um, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, that that is that is something that John is tasked with, and he regularly has conversations with them. Um, that is always a, a a question that regularly comes up. They usually address the uh, the annual progress at the presentation they give during the Dayton Hamvention. Um, kind of seems to be the gathering. Um, but if you are curious about where the the progress sits at this particular moment in time, I would send an email to that Oxcom email address and ask the question. Um, there has been talk about moving logistics directly under the incident commander or moving communications rather from logistics to being part of command staff. That was um, initially um, taken off the table by some of the other stakeholders involved in the process, because unfortunately it's not just us and or FEMA that makes that decision. There's a lot of other players in the NIMS process and how that works, the Coast Guard, the wildland fire community, um, other organizations that, that, um, that, that participate in making that system what it is. And, um, there were other other factors in play. Um, and it looks like that's the end of the questions. Did anybody else have any any questions? Well, I'll make a comment, and that is if you're comparing yourself to John, John does a great job, but you did a great job too. It, it's a little different, but very fulfilling. It uh, answers a lot of questions. You did a great job. We appreciate you coming on and doing this. No, no problem. Thank you very much for the uh, opportunity. And like I said, if anybody has um, any questions, um, my email address will be in the presentation and I will uh, send that out um, here shortly so that um, they can put it up on the website. Okay. Uh, will you send that to me, please? Yep. Appreciate that. Uh, a quick note from Ross Merlin. He said he'd be much rather be rich than famous. <laughs> <laughs> well, wouldn't we all? <laughs> Ross is very famous, though, and I, I commend Ross for the work that he did because he did something uh, that was needed for a long time uh, that took a lot of, of um, you know, just somebody to take the initiative to do it mostly. Um, so he started a, a great thing that's been used successfully by a lot of people. Um, so tell him I said hi. Okay.
Uh, nothing more in chat. Uh, no hands up. Let's just open it real quick for comments. Any comments out there? Any questions? Any answers? That was a tough uh, sub <coughs> excuse me, subject, and I thought uh, Justin did an excellent job. There's yes, a lot, a lot of a lot of tentacles to cover carefully. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Thank you. Yes, we all think you did a great, great job. One, one more question. Okay. Uh, does CISA have specific positions to deal with other federal executive branch agencies? Um, as far as communications or? Yes, uh, specifically. So yes and no. Um, we have representatives that deal with federal agencies regarding interoperability. We are currently um, have an initiative in progress to expand that. Um, I am not at liberty to say exactly what that will look like, mostly because I don't know. I've only heard speculation, uh, but that is increasing uh, because we, we realize that there are um, a lot of, of interoperability issues, not only between federal agencies and state and local agencies, but between federal agencies and other federal agencies, um, there sometimes are interoperability issues. Um, and so that that is one of the things that we are uh, building up right now is, um, is a, a, a broader array of federal interoperability um, partners and solutions, if you will. Okay, I try to follow the daily uh, CISA published vulnerabilities and weekly assessments for the ITSL. And I, I just cannot imagine the resources it takes to do that and then put it out there publicly. Yes, and on the cybersecurity side, um, so the infrastructure, or I'm sorry, the cybersecurity division, CSD, um, they are continually uh, hiring um, threat analysts and cybersecurity advisors, and uh, every state has a cybersecurity advisor assigned. Um, there are regional cybersecurity advisors, and all of that manpower just collects information and aggregates it and puts together those vulnerability reports. And it really is a massive undertaking. And as you know, the more stuff we put on the network, uh, the more the more risk we undertake of of uh, vulnerabilities and being attacked. And um, so that is a continual process. It's a constant daily game of whack-a-mole. <laughs> yes, it is. Okay, Steve's got a question out there. When will Utah EMA adopt CISA shares Winwick? <laughs> I don't know. Oddly enough, I live in Utah, but I don't, uh, Utah is not one of my states. So um, that, that's a good question. I know we do a lot, or we were doing a lot of WinLink training on the amateur side, um, but honestly, we don't have a lot of active shares stations in Utah. Um, I have a shares, I don't have a permanent shares station. I have a portable shares station, so I don't get to check, I don't get to listen into the nets very often. Um, but when I was listening to the nets regularly, I just didn't hear much, that much activity uh, from Utah. So I, I really can't answer that question. Okay. After we do this, uh, wrap this up, uh, you said you're going to send me the slides. Uh, there's, I can't think of anything else here, unless there's a uh, last shot at some more questions or comments. 